Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining. I'm Lenore Adam. I'm on the product marketing team here at Delphix. I'm joined today by Alberto Sedgismondi on our product management team and Doug Smith on our Cloud Alliances team. The topic for today's webinar focuses on data agility for app dev. Specifically, we'll look at some of the real world challenges for test data management in a hybrid cloud architecture and explore data ops practices that increase efficiency of CI CD workflows in this model. Enterprises today have a cloud first approach when implementing new technology initiatives, shedding legacy systems and processes to increase agility in a competitive digital market. Leveraging the flexibility of a cloud infrastructure introduces operational efficiencies that are unattainable in an on-prem data center. 451 Research just released a study of enterprise customers that found that 95% of new apps are built in the cloud. Organizations not only realize the operational efficiencies of infrastructure as a service, but they are leveraging unprecedented observability into product usage and ease of experimentation to make data-driven product decisions faster than ever. In that same survey though, they found that 58% of enterprises are moving to a hybrid IT model, which is emerging as the standard architecture and organizing principle of their IT estates. Why is this? Well, legacy apps aren't going away and are slowly, if ever, migrating to the cloud. Plus, data sovereignty laws also enter into the equation where data is subject to the laws of the country in which it is collected and must remain local. The general description of a hybrid architecture is where on-prem apps, whether they're using bare metal servers or a private cloud configuration, work in an integrated fashion with a public cloud or clouds. Moving app dev to the cloud is often the first step in the cloud journey, where DevOps teams can quickly spin up and tear down test environments for a multi-stage release pipeline. The experience gained from cloud-based lower-level environments provides an opportunity to refine and re-architect IT procedures, as well as address data security concerns that may hinder wide-scale cloud adoption. So cloud-based app dev creates the foundation then for accelerating cloud adoption. DevOps teams realize increased flexibility and lower costs for test environments that often outnumber production by four or five to one. Application teams are establishing automated, repeatable software delivery processes because infrastructure is now code. And if migrating workloads, significant dev test and rehearsals are taking place in the cloud prior to production cutover, and DevOps workflows are optimized and modernized. And finally, security teams are creating new governance and policies for when data moves outside the firewall. But what happens when your code is now agile in the cloud, but your data is not? So while DevOps practices are evaluated and improved, the same should be true for the data pipeline that feeds the release train the data pipeline has become a blind spot in an automated DevOps workflow, which results in a data agility problem that drives bad behavior and slows the delivery pipeline. A lack of data agility becomes apparent when you think of the scale of enterprise apps and databases. It can take days and days to refresh a large 25 terabyte database, for example, for cloud-based test environments. It could take weeks to secure test data because of those old manual on-prem processes that you're still stuck with. And application teams can't get production quality data into CI-CD tool chains for comprehensive testing. Enter data ops. The emerging practice of data ops focuses on the fast and secure movement of data. Think DevOps for data. Data Ops has modernized test data management, eliminating long-standing wait states that limit release velocity. Data Ops is about making data portable, accessible, and secure. Let's take a step back and get a better understanding of the real-world challenges for data agility 
when application development is in the cloud and production remains on-prem. And here I'm going to ask Alberto to step in. Thanks, Lenore. So thanks, thanks to uh, my job, I have the opportunity to talk on a weekly basis with many organizations about um, the challenges they have when they move not just development environments, but sometimes other uh, non-prod environments to the clouds. And there are many reasons why they would want to do that. Um, clouds are actually differentiating themselves by these type of services. And while you know, development and testing is one service that you know, can be provided definitely by the major public cloud vendors, there are some of these cloud vendors that are um, offering better uh, services for other non-prod applications <clears throat> like business analytics or artificial intelligence, just to example two. But let's stay, let's stay with the use case of, you know, you move to your development and testing environment to the cloud. It might be for one, you know, application or one part of your team. And you're keeping your um, production environment on premises. So, uh, this is very typical. Uh, this is very typical, especially in, you know, large enterprises um, where the core business still, rely, still relies on um, these, um, you know, very large ERP systems, for example. Um, the, the first problem that I usually see customers complaining about is that, you know, dealing with these large traditional databases, if you will, right? So I'm talking about the large Oracle databases, DB2 databases, SAP, those were databases we have to start thinking that those databases were not designed with data agility in mind 30, 40 years ago, right? So what usually um, I see is that customers, while they have the entire process of the application development lifecycle on premises, they, you know, they have current ways to provision copies of data for testing, for example, right? they use the tools that were actually part of the initial design of those databases, backup tools. So they restore them, right? Then after the backup tools, of course, they started to use a lot in the last years, you know, snapshot um, technologies from, you know, maybe some of the more advanced file systems, but especially from the storage vendors. But once they move that dev and test environment to the cloud, they realize that the challenges that they had are now actually bigger challenges because there is, you know, a lot more distance to cover um, and, and, and they have to move these very large databases, not just within the uh, one data center, but, you know, potentially one or more, you know, external data centers that are actually governed and managed by a third party vendors. And that put a lot of extra, extra challenges. Um, I want to focus in probably what's the top, uh, what is the top challenge, right? Which is network bottlenecks. So again, while you were in prem, you see customers using, of course, like nice, you know, uh, network bandwidth available, of course, within the data center, other technologies as well, like, you know, fiber channel, for example, for, you know, storage um, snapshot replication and things like that. When they move these um, environments for, you know, in, in this use case, we're using dev and test to one cloud, the first bottleneck is a network. And yes, you can actually expand that if available, but there is a cost and that cost is not insignificant as we know it. So now you have this challenge of moving the same very large database to the cloud and you find that, you know, some of the processes that you wanted to improve from a dev and test perspective by gaining new tools and a more, much more modern environment is anyway, you know, slow down, um, due to the fact that you have still the big gorilla of the uh, data set to move to, um, uh, to this new environment. So the, the, then w once you are moved um, and you find a solution um, to get the data to the cloud, you realize that you are 
in another challenge. And that challenge usually is, you know, when you are testing, right? So let's add the following to the context. You usually embrace this new environment and you also change many people related processes. The most typical of, all, of them all is you are leveraging, you know, agile development best practices. You have a new, you know, uh, CI CD tool chain that now you can actually use because of the fact that you have modern, you know, uh, hardware and software technologies in the clouds. And um, the problem that you find with data agility there is that, you know, your test data will not be able to keep the pace with the new velocity in developing. Because you are moving into a world of, you know, uh, more like a waterfall de development best practice where you probably had three, six months, nine months to develop, you know, a feature and then pass that to QA. And in these three, six, nine months, you actually had the time to move and create and provision copies of the test data that would be used for that specific feature. Um, in this case, you are moving into a world where potentially you are releasing, you know, chunks of code into QA every two weeks. How can you adapt the data to the speed of that development and testing is very, very difficult if you have the challenges we discussed before. Um, and one example of that, that we can I, I also find um, regularly in, in many of the customers we talk to is the difficulty to link database states with code changes, right? And the most typical example of this is because of the quality of your test data is not great, a lot of bugs are usually um, created after that. And you, know, you realize that once you release and of course, you know, your, your end users or customers complain and, you know, potentially they open support tickets. And at the end of the day, the people that get these problems are the same engineers that developed the code in the first place. So you are yet adding another piece of slowliness or inefficiency to what you thought would be a much better development methodology. But what happened is that you hit a bug like potentially weeks after or months after it was released to the customer and it's very important to be able to test or replicate that situation exactly the same way it happened to your customers. So when you, when you don't have data agility, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to bring back the snapshot of the data to the moment that bug happened. And be able to have that ability is definitely something that can you know, improve substantially the experience of your developers or your, you know, your employees, but at the end of the day, the quality of the result, uh, resulted application. Um, another challenge that I want to touch on today um, is, and in my mind is one of the most important challenges nowadays in the world is anonymization, right? Um, many of you are part of very important industries, especially finance, uh, manufacturing, and healthcare, where the data needs to be obfuscated um, to ensure that no matter where you are moving that data, you are safe. Actually, we are safe as your customers, right? So the fact that you still need to manually um, you know, obfuscate data, leveraging database scripts for multiple database versions, br uh, brands, and actually sometimes even, you know, underlying, you know, operating systems and environments is a big bottleneck to an efficient data obfuscation process. So you have to find a way to improve, um, you know, how your data is obfuscated and masked before you actually you distribute it to the new cloud environments, not when um, the data is already there. And, and the last challenge I want to focus on today is about, you know, it's not only now about application development and testing. Um, 10 years ago, definitely the major consumer of copy data were, was engineering, right? Um, but with the explosion of software, 
potentially every single company in the world is developing some software. And it's not just about the core business application only. You will now have to face with a lot more data consumers within your organization. And I mentioned it a couple of them before, um, business analytics and you know, artificial intelligence applications uh, are, are the two major ones in my experience uh, talking to our customers um, after development and testing. And the interesting part is that all of them will need the same data, but potentially different formats, potentially different obfuscation requirements and potentially at different times. So now IT ops find themselves or a, say, let's say it, a database administrator or many more than one find themselves repeating the same process they used to do only for application development and testing for many other consumers. And that add, of course, um, a lot of time and a lot of um, you know, inefficiencies in the process. So what is the impact of all of that, right? So the impact is actually that you end up subsetting, you know, these databases. And, you know, sometimes, again, I see cur uh, commonly that customers will subset a database equally for all of their consumers. And, you know, you know many times we hear from the consumers themselves that that is exactly not the way they you know, uh, or the most efficient way, right, for them to get this data. So what happens is that they need to readjust the data to their needs. So you could have developers that need to add, you know, um, uh, to the database themselves or, you know, refill some database columns or fields, right, with dump data combined actually to real actually data coming from the production database. And that is not, you know, the greatest of the outcomes. Um, the other, the other um, impact it has is, you know, how to keep up with the incredibly high database change rates. Think about, you know, your industry and think about all the applications that you are giving to your customers through apps and websites and support. Um, basically, your databases are getting changes on the microsecond for many of your industries out there. So are you or not able to provide a refresh of all of those changes, you know, efficiently and rapidly to the different consumers of your data, yes or no? If the answer is no, you really need to consider how to improve this process. The other part is um, how costly these cloud environments are. Um, you know, years ago, we start thinking that, well, cloud will also be a tremendous amount of, um, uh, or provide tremendous amount of cost efficiencies uh, for all of us. And we realize now that it's not, you know, true all the times. Um, but there are ways to make this true, right? Um, we cannot anymore think about in development and testing to keep our data sets forever or incrementing forever. Um, projects that we start and we never finish, right? So we have to be able within our new development or modern development best practices to be able to create environments and destroy environments very fast. And interestingly enough, CICD, you know, in the CICD tool chain, we do have tools for the code that allow us to do that. But unfortunately, there aren't tools that you can automate um, I mean, there are tools, but are not like very common that allows you to automate the same way the data you use for, especially for testing. Um, and, and that's what creates, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, data related defects, right? But, and as I said before, you are trying to improve a process in development and testing, but at the end of the day, your same developers will get a lot of extra work from the bugs that they are creating due to um, the, um, uh, the data not being at a perfect state or pristine state for, uh, for testing. Um, the, um, the last part I want to focus in impacts and effects is really about, uh, once again, security, right? 
Um, and I want to touch on this again because I am a customer of yours, possibly, uh, especially in, in finance, for sure, maybe healthcare. And I like to think that you keep my data safe um, when you distribute this data around to all of your environments. So not just this and that, but you know, all of the other non product environments that we talked. And I like to think that you are actually sharing you know, this data in the, in the safest way as possible. I am not referring only to infrastructure type security, like you know, in transit encryption and so on, but really <clears throat> obfuscating all of my sensitive data before it leaves this safe you know, production environment. That is something you should absolutely think about um, because the fact that you can actually distribute this data to your end users already obfuscated, think about it. It removes the real value of the data out of the gate, right? Um, and we can all sleep better. So <clears throat> now that we focus a little bit into real world you know, challenges um, that we see on a, on a weekly basis in, in the customers we talk to, let's talk about some of the best practices. Um, so I, I like to be like to split this in four chunks. And the first one is um, your ability to leverage, you know, virtualize data sets, right? Virtualization is nothing nowadays. However, that is true, um, you know, across the board. And, and, you know, I think that that's a given. However, for some reason, it's not, uh, practice that we see all the times leverage it fully for the data. Definitely see it for, you know, VMs, um, you know, storage, but, you know, for the data itself uh, is something we don't see and you should be doing a lot more. The fact that you can replace the big traditional terabyte size, you know, full databases and, and look for ways that are not efficient, um, you know, to distribute them faster the fact that you can replace that with lightweight and portable data sets that are virtualized and actually without, once you virtualize the data, usually also you're removing a lot of risks of, you know, uh, moving production copies around, um, gives you the opportunity to think about the underlying infrastructure very differently, right? You don't have to think anymore in incredibly big and costly bandwidth. Um, you don't have to think anymore, you know, what many tools I can use to distribute that data efficiently and fast because it's already lightweight and portable. You can actually use, you know, simple tools available to you um, to distribute that data around. The other part that is very important in this process is that usually if you have a very good virtualization tool for data, you will be able to synchronize those changes that I mentioned before that are coming in your production databases a lot faster, if not almost in real time. Um, and, and, you know, that is absolutely important because what it means is that all of your consumers will have usually an on-demand, you know, uh, uh, like very fresh data to use when they need it, right? It's not anymore about all the you know, additional amount of resources and time, some people in IT ops will need to spend to actually make that refresh to happen. But it's a, a completely automated process. Um, the, the second bucket is, you know, eliminate wait states, right? A good way to think about where you have inefficiency is to talk to the consumers and understand where are the wait states. Um, you know, uh, usually what happens here is in the, in the example, in the challenges we were, um, we, were, we were using before is that because you don't have or you don't want your end users or consumers to wait, what you're doing is that you're providing them with, you know, not the best data around, right? And that's where I, we hear, well, yeah, you know, they have definitely data available, but we refresh it twice a year or we just refresh it once a quarter because it takes a month to do, right? And a lot of resources, but they do have the data. Well, you know, that is, is not actually the best scenario because you are actually succeeded in removing the, the waiting time, but you are not providing them, right, with the best data. 
So if you want to prevent them with the best data and at the same time you want to remove the weight, once again, data virtualization is something that will really help you. Um, it's not only about the waiting times, it's how they will leverage the data. Um, a good data virtualization tool usually will uh, provide a, you know, a UI that you know, it will have in user access and they will see exactly the data they are allowed to see that is hopefully, as I mentioned before, already masked, and, and I'll touch on that in a, in a while. Um, but at the same time, you cannot use UIs if you don't need to, because all of these tools will ideally be 100% you know, API available, and you can automate uh, data um, availability into your uh, CI CD tool change by leveraging the uh, tools APIs. The third part is um, how, you know, how do you bring this automation and this data availability into uh, your entire software development life cycle, right? And there are two things that I like to stress out uh, as a best practice here. The first one, again, is the ability to synchronize um, the, diver the different you know, data sets um, that are actually coming potentially from the same source database for the different consumers. And once again, you, that is something that you have automated, that you should have automated and not manually provided, right? So the ability to synchronize into different data sets for different consumers exactly in the format they needed, exactly you know, at, 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 with the, with, at the time they needed is very important. And, and once again, that is something that a good uh, data virtualization tool can provide via UI or integrated in a tool chain via API. And once you have that, the, your consumers will like, you know, benefit and enjoy from the fact that we can add, you know, version control to uh, their, their data. They can, you know, uh, do things like refresh and rewind, you know, data. They can destroy that, uh, you know, all of that flexibility will definitely help in improving the overall software development um, life cycle. And finally, as I mentioned before, security. Um, it's very important that while you um, uh, provide or while you, you start using a data virtualization tool, please do not underestimate security. The reason I'm telling you this is because it will become potentially so easy for consumers to create their own data sets at the time they need on demand. It, as I said before, via you know, APIs or you know, via a, a UI, that you will actually see potentially more of these data sets right, uh, being virtualized and, and created for the consumer. So your ability to provide that availability already with added security already with provide that, uh, um, you know, um, uh, data availability that is already masked for the different consumer, depending who they are and what they do is absolutely key. So, and that removes a huge risk from the, you know, uh, from a governance, a governance perspective, especially for IT ops or for the data owner. And think about it, removes also a huge burden for the consumer that sometimes do not want to deal with data that is not properly obfuscated or masked. Um, so you are doing, again, a favor and removing a huge risk for the organization, but at the same time, you're removing a huge weight from the shoulders of these consumers that should not be responsible um, of uh, you know, how the data is actually masked, sensitive data is actually masked. And, and I'm not mentioning, of course, the importance of these best practice to comply with your local regulation, no matter you know, where you are in the world. Um, all right, ne next slide. For, um, for, for the next slide and beyond, I'd like to uh, invite Doug um, to the conversation so that he can explain you know, uh, how Delphix can help to provide all of these services um, that we just discussed about. Thank you, Alberto. Um, 
As uh, Alberto discussed, those best practices, um, the Delphix platform is a modern data ops platform. Um, as a modern data ops platform, one of the key things that we focus on is the delivery of those lightweight clone data sets, um, those key application data sets that help drive and run your business. Um, and we can deliver that in, you know, in a wide variety of locations and areas um, to address the, where you're ever, wherever you're at in terms of that cloud journey um, or even from an on-premise perspective. But key, a key component to that fast delivery of these lightweight clones is the ability to govern and, and secure that data um, for the constituencies that, that may need access, but may not need access to all of the sensitive information. So, you know, not only is it enabling the delivery of that data in a fast, lightweight fashion, uh, regardless of where you need it, but then also securing that data uh, and helping you comply with the various regulations that Alberto mentioned. So things like, you know, GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA, uh, wide array of acronyms, I apologize for that, but uh, I'm sure you get, you know, the picture of, you know, the need to uh, adhere to those regulations, also to just maintain your company's reputation to prevent data breach or you know, becoming you know, a, a, a noteworthy news item, um, not for something positive, but uh, because data may have been lost or stolen, um, you certainly don't wanna put you know, your organization at risk. But the other important factor of that is not just you know, securing the data in those methods that again, Alberto had mentioned, encrypting, et cetera, but basically giving data to the developers, testers in formats that are equivalent to and the same as production data, but with but is fictitious. So to those developers and testers, they interact with and use, you know, real first names, you know, last names, addresses, et cetera, but it is all fictitious. So they get the data in the format that they want and desire, but it is fictitious. So, you know, if it were to be, you know, screenshotted, um, outputted or whatever, um, and then, you know, moved outside the organization, rest assured that that data is still safe and secure because again, it is fictitious. Um, once we have that data in that secured format, in that lightweight delivered clone, then we can accelerate how that data is used. Again, from an application development and testing perspective, integrating now, not just code change uh, and you know, test automation, but then integrating data into that automation delivery in, into that pipeline so that at the end of the day, you can begin to address the real business value, which is you know, um, maintaining a competitive edge in the market that you may be in for your business, um, accessing or creating new customer experiences, which are key to you know, market advantage, et cetera. But, you know, enabling the true business drivers that help your organization succeed. Uh, and then let's take a look at, you know, how more specifically the Delphix platform enables that. So if you think about today, your environment in your data center, you have key applications that could be an ERP system that manages inventory, um, sales order entry, cash, you know, um, orders to cash, et cetera. CRM, how you interact with your customers, or even those custom, you know, web-based applications that you use internally for interaction or that your customers use to, you know, engage or order your, you know, products and services. Delphix stays, you know, basically synchronizes with those production sources um, and stays synchronized with that using the, the methods and mechanisms that the database uh, manufacturer or the data provider provides. So, and we do that non-disruptively. Um, in doing that, we, once we have that information on the platform, um, we'll compress it. So, you know, a 10 terabyte database may actually be compressed by as much as 70% onto the Delphix platform itself. So, you know, um, when uh, Alberto talked about, you know, the movement of data from one place to another, um, you can see just by the, the mere fact that we compress the amount of data being managed, we can then move that data in, in a much faster time frame. Um, in addition to that, once we've moved it once, um, we can then just look at what data has changed and then only move that change data on an ongoing basis to keep the data synchronized across all of your locations wherever you may want it. At the same time, prior to moving that data, if the requirement is that you want to secure it and anonymize that sensitive information, we can do that as well. 
architecturally what I'm showing here is that we, you know, we virtualize and synchronize with that source data in the production data center, likely in the production network zone, because in many organizations that is going to be a segmented network environment. Um, we would also then mask the data in that same zone. Once we have that mask data available, that is the data that would be moved to the desired location on, on the right side of, of this picture. Once we have that, that secure data moved, then we can create those lightweight clones very quickly that I spoke of, regardless of the size of the data set. So I'm not actually copying a 10 terabyte database uh, and creating multiple 10 terabyte copies. I'm basically initiating the provisioning of a virtualized clone of that to a target. And I can do that you know, in an unlimited number of ways. And then at that point, I'm just managing the individual blocks that change for each individual consumer. So we can get you know, some highly leveraged and uh, high efficiencies in terms of not only data delivery, but ongoing data management and you know, significant impact in terms of infrastructure and cost savings you know, at, the end, at the end point target location. If we look at, you know, um, a, a, a interesting scenario of not only just the ability to create the, the lightweight virtualized clone, um, and, but more importantly, being able to do things with that that you can't do with a physical copy. So in this scenario, and if you think about, you know, application development today, particularly those new native cloud applications that are looking to enhance customer experiences, perhaps uh, enable mobile application um, execution. Um, it's no longer, you know, one interface tied to one database. It, it may be an application that leverages and utilizes data from multiple sources. So in that case, you want the ability to deliver all of the data that that application team may need to ensure that that, that, uh, that, that application works across all of the data sets that it, it needs access to. The platform enables taking and synchronizing those data sets at the same points in time. I can deliver those data sets either individually or as an integrated set to various constituents. I can mask the data differently for those constituents. So that constituency may not just be development and test, it may be for data science purposes. So I may want to run reports or, or do analytics or AI ML against you know, a certain type of data set um, and demographic, but I only want to see certain aspects of that. I, I don't want to see, you know, actual names, birth dates, things of that nature. So the platform provides the flexibility to anonymize data for constituencies based on their need and desire and deliver either single or integrated data sets for application testing and delivery. Um, the other thing that, that we can do with those virtual data sets is create bookmarks. Um, at specific points in time that are key to certain functions. So once I, let's say, refresh my data, so I now have a set of, a set of fresh data from the, per, you know, that originated from my production environment. It, it has been masked appropriately, uh, but before I do anything with it, I want to basically make sure that I can always get back to that pristine point um, in time is what I like to call it. So I can create a bookmark. Um, before I run a test, my test can be destructive in nature, which would be a concern because once I run the test, if it fails, getting back to a, a usable point um, for that data set may be a big challenge without our platform. So I create my bookmark, I run my test, I get to the end of the test, I look at the result, and I said, you know what, it, the, the test failed. It, it didn't uh, execute the way I expected. So I can quickly reset using this Delphix platform back to that pristine point in time, make changes to either my test or my application, rerun the test um, and go from there. Um, and, and that can be done very quickly, it can be done in a fully automated fashion. So if I want to increase the level of automation across my test environments, um, I can do that using any orchestration platform, um, Jenkins, um, Ansible, you name the orchestration platform, um, our solution can be integrated with it. At the end of the day, again, what we're trying to drive is, you know, greater agility, um, accelerated delivery of application releases, which again, tie to the business value of addressing, you know, market conditions, you know, new opportunities for revenue generation, et cetera. So if we take a look at, you know, how, you know, the platform can be leveraged and utilized, 
again, the, the, one of the great aspects of the platform is, you know, it's not, you know, specific to any particular operating environment, whether that be on premise in the cloud, multiple clouds, combination of the two of those or all of those, um, or line of business. So our platform is being used by, you know, major financial services firms, which includes banking, insurance, um, you know, asset management, et cetera, um, you know, colleges, universities, um, retail, consumer packaged goods, healthcare, um, doesn't really matter what line of business you're in, the platform can be leveraged and utilized across a, a broad spectrum of applications and database platforms. Again, we can integrate into, you know, orchestration, you know, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines, um, application dev support, um, both for the cloud migration, you know, so how can you, you know, look to leverage the cloud for development and test agility, but maintain on premise, you know, production, um, you know, we can accelerate the movement of that data, anonymize it, and then, you know, um, increase um, rehearsal and, and, in te and test capabilities so that you can ensure that if you do want to migrate the production application, you understand what it's going to take, how it's going to work prior to that movement. Um, and again, securing that, you know, those cloud native environments as well. So, you know, not just traditional data sets, but those data sets that may be housed in, you know, platform as a service areas, you know, we can certainly use the same capabilities, um, you know, from a data security perspective that are used, you know, for some of those traditional database and data sets. Well, let's take a, a closer look at a real world example. So as you might imagine, um, in the insurance sector, particularly in health insurance, whether that be, you know, your traditional health or in this case, um, dental health, you know, maintaining um, compliance with um, constantly changing regulations. Also, the ability to, you know, introduce and provide services in new states, which in, in our environment today in the United States, you know, each state may have its own regulations. So core applications may need to be modified and adjusted to accommodate, you know, those the different requirements for the different states uh, that you may operate in. And again, just ongoing changes within those states where you already operate, um, how, you know, those changes need to take place making sure you become more effective in terms of interacting with your customer. Um, so as a consumer of, you know, a dental health care program, you may want to see, you know, what claims you've, you've had, how those claims were paid. You may have issue with those claims. You know, you know in the past, you may have just called into the service provider, um, said you had an issue or a question, and you would interact with an individual. More and more, that interaction today is through your mobile device. So how you enable those capabilities on your mobile device, um, what capabilities exist, all factor into, you know, in this case, Dentegra, um, also known uh, previously as Delta Dental, uh, of whatever state that you may be a, a, a resident in. But, you know, their ability to address those changes um, was, you know, a factor of one, their ability to leverage the cloud to accelerate application delivery to meet those changing demands um, and, and need for infrastructure. Um, and as you might imagine, because they're in that healthcare space, the ability to secure and anonymize that data to ensure compliance with HIPAA regulation and all of the other regulations was key. Um, what they were able to do is to leverage the Delphix data ops platform to, you know, integrate with their source data on premise and maintain that on premise production environment, but then look to then mask and then replicate that data to both AWS and to offshore teams um, so that they could improve and accelerate application testing, application change and delivery um, and do that on an ongoing basis. And they've had a great deal of success in doing that. Um, on our website, you'll also find uh, a more detailed synopsis of the Dentegra's journey um, to the cloud and how they've been able to leverage that platform. So I would encourage you to, to hit our website to see not only, you know, their experience uh, and their journey to the cloud and how our platform, you know, helped them accelerate that and, and uh, more importantly, um, help them maintain efficiencies on an ongoing basis. As it, as it relates to that, but you'll also see a lot of other customers in other business segments that have had success. And with that, 
uh, we'll open it up for questions. Awesome, thanks Alberto and Doug. Uh, we do have a few questions here, just a handful that came in while you guys were talking. We may, may have answered some of these while you were speaking, but uh, the first question is, do you need to replicate the entire data set again when you refresh a cloud environment? Well, so uh, as I was mentioning, the, the way the platform works is once we've replicated the initial data set on an ongoing basis, we're only going to replicate or send change data. Um, and that is a much smaller amount of data um, and can be done at desired frequencies. So it can be done at prescribed intervals, can be done ad hoc. But, you know, once we send it once uh, on an ongoing basis, only, you know, change data blocks would be changed on, or would be sent on an ongoing basis. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. The next question is about data masking. Where in the process does the data get masked? Can you just clarify that? Uh, sure. So, you know, um, again, flexibility in terms of how that uh, can be facilitated. Um, sometimes that is driven by just, you know, customer requirement and, and architecture. Um, but in most cases, we see the data, you know, being masked in the production zone or production, you know, subnet. Um, you know, we would create one of those lightweight virtual clones of the source data there. We would mask it. And then we, we would use our secure data distribution to then distribute that mask data to whatever other location you may want, whether that be in, you know, another data center that you manage into the cloud of choice. Um, you know, you have a great deal of flexibility with, you know, where you can move that data once you, you know, have it created and masked um, in that production zone. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, the ability to create that replication profile, as we call it, or specification um, that allows you to find what data gets moved and what frequency also just leverages one specific port, network port. So, you know, from an, a uh, management uh, and security perspective, you know, very easy to enable and manage on an ongoing basis. Okay, uh, looks like one more question. Um, does Delphix support any type of database or files type? Sure, maybe Alberto, maybe you want to take that? Yeah, I can get that, absolutely. So, um, so the answer is uh, Delphix support uh, a number of databases uh, natively. And let me explain what is that. So we, our engineering organization, you know, proactively Put the work to support the great majority of the databases, uh, the, the most popular databases out there. I'm talking about Oracle, SQL Server, um, ASC, DB2, you know, and so on. Um, they, uh, but because it's very, very difficult to keep up with the um, speed of especially modern databases, right? Um, we decided to, uh, about a year ago, to really become a platform. Uh, we have a program, a software development toolkit uh, that uh, we leverage to help uh, partners or the same customers to develop plugins to support, uh, you know, potentially any database in the market. So, um, and this is, a, this is a very good thing because for us, is sometimes very difficult to justify the cost to support a small new database, but um, for a specific customer can be very important. So um, we, what we would do is we jointly find a technical partner or if the customer has some you know, development uh, skills in-house, they can do it themselves and we help them um, um, you know, with, that, with that process. So um, depending on the database you are interested, we can, uh, we can provide a more specific answer, but that's generally how we, we work. And, and you also talked about files. Um, absolutely, yes. We, we do have technology that allows to mask, um, uh, virtualize and mask, um, you know, just files. All right, great. That was, that was all the questions. Thanks so much, Alberto and Doug, and thanks everyone for joining. All right, thank you. Thank you.